Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore why Apple's repairs are so expensive. Because if you've ever cracked your iPhone screen and taken it to the Apple Store to get it repaired, you may have been shocked by just how pricey it was. I recently shattered the corner of my 3 month old Apple Watch, and getting this screen replaced would have cost me $300, which is about 70% of the watch's retail price. So it made more sense for me to just buy a new one. And stories like these have only become more common as Apple's repair prices have been on the rise. Now this video topic came in second place in last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way, the weekly poll will show up right in your mobile activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. Now there is something I want to make clear before we talk about Apple in particular, and that is, the repair cost of almost all electronics have been steadily increasing for the past decade. It's certainly not a phenomenon exclusive to Apple. I'm simply using Apple as a prime example, since it's the company I'm most familiar with, and because they do happen to charge a little more for repairs than their competition. So in order to understand why Apple's repair prices are so high today, we have to begin by taking a look at how their products have developed over the years. Because it's very easy to look at this issue and jump to the conclusion that Apple's just being greedy and trying to make more money, but it's actually much more complicated than that. Products like the iPhone, iPad, and MacBook have all changed in many ways since they were first released, and some of those upgrades came at the cost of repairability. Because if you were around for the MacBook's early days, you'll probably remember its user-replaceable battery that could easily be swapped out. And this was considered by many to be a necessary feature, because that's when the MacBook's estimated battery life was just 5 hours, about half of what it is today. So many users carried around a fully charged backup to replace the battery once it was depleted. And the ability to instantly charge your notebook was a huge convenience for users on the go. But in 2008, Apple released the new MacBook Air that featured a non-removable battery. And at first, this decision didn't go over well with customers, who could no longer enjoy the convenience of battery swapping, and would be forced to pay for pricey battery replacements once it degraded. But it didn't come without its benefits. The battery technology used in the original MacBook Air was pretty groundbreaking for its time, and it was the primary reason why the product even existed. Because instead of using traditional cylindrical lithium-ion cells, Apple created custom lithium polymer cells that were thin and rectangular, which allowed the battery to fill up the entire volume of the Air's chassis, leaving no wasted space. Also, by making the battery non-removable, Apple could do away with components that took up valuable space for the battery. And all of these changes allowed Apple to squeeze in 30% more battery and make the product dramatically thinner than any MacBook before it. So for Apple, the benefits of a non-removable battery outweighed the drawback of more expensive replacements and repairs. Another good example is with the iPad, because when the original was introduced in 2010, it featured a non-laminated display, which meant the front glass was separated from the LCD panel underneath, and you could actually see a small gap between the two. So if you happened to crack the screen, it could be replaced fairly easily and affordably, since all that needed to be replaced was the front piece of glass. But this changed beginning with the iPad Air in 2013. It was upgraded to a laminated display, where the glass and LCD panel were actually fused together into one unit. And just like with the MacBook Air's battery, it came with advantages and disadvantages. One nice thing was that the gap of air under the glass was no longer there, so when you tapped on the display, the pixels were much closer to your fingertips, which made interactions feel more natural. And this would become even more important when Apple introduced the Apple Pencil. Also, the laminated display allowed the iPad to be even thinner, which was a big selling point of the iPad Air. But the disadvantage was that if your iPad screen cracked, the front glass and LCD panel needed to be replaced, which made the repair cost skyrocket. So these examples demonstrate the struggle companies like Apple face when trying to create the most appealing product on the market. Because the reality is, for most customers, a thin and light device will always be more desirable than a thicker, heavier device with a removable battery and non-laminated display. So it isn't much of a surprise that companies like Apple don't make repairability a priority when designing products. But there's more to the story than this. Because so far, we've discussed why parts have become more expensive, but there's actually another element that has a far greater influence on repair costs, and that's labor. 
because if you think about it, Apple products, with the exception of the Mac Pro, are all made in China, where labor is cheap and assembly lines are efficient. So labor cost per unit is kept to a minimum. But when you go to an Apple store to get something repaired, you're essentially hiring a worker from your home country to disassemble and reassemble your device by hand, which can be a very time-consuming and challenging process, especially with something like the Apple Watch, which wasn't designed to be taken apart. And that's why a screen replacement for the Apple Watch is actually more expensive than the iPhone XS, priced at $300 compared to $280. It isn't the display itself that's pricier, but rather the labor. Now I want to discuss an issue that's been brought up a lot lately, where Apple's Genius Bar workers incorrectly diagnose issues with products, and this has resulted in users paying exorbitant repair fees for services they don't even need. In fact, back when my Series 3 Apple Watch was experiencing random shutdowns, employees at my local Apple store advised me to purchase a battery replacement for $80 since it must be degraded or faulty. But I decided against it, and after leaving my watch on its charger for over 24 hours, I never had an issue with it shutting down again. Now, I don't mean to suggest that Apple employees are maliciously misleading users into purchasing repairs they don't need. I just think when you have people working in a fast-paced retail setting, decisions have to be made quickly. And when wrong decisions are made, it comes at a significant expense of the users. So considering how pricey it can be to repair an Apple product, I'd like to see more deliberate care taken by the company to ensure issues are being correctly diagnosed. I should also point out that Apple puts a lot of pressure on their retail employees to attach Apple Care warranties onto as many product sales as possible. And although they don't earn a commission, employees do receive perks or punishments depending on how many Apple Care warranties they sell. I've even heard of workers being fired for failing to meet monthly sales goals for Apple Care. And this shouldn't be too surprising, considering Apple Care is part of Apple's services business, a business the company has been growing aggressively for years. In fact, services is Apple's second largest source of revenue, ahead of the iPad and the Mac. And this leads many to believe Apple's trying to encourage sales of Apple Care by showing customers how expensive repairs are out of warranty. And while I believe there might be some truth to this, you also have to consider that most of Apple's repair prices aren't that much more than their competition. And as I mentioned before, I think it has more to do with how modern devices are being made and how much labor is required to make the repair. But I think the most concerning part of all this is Apple's stance on their customers' right to repair. Because under the current system, only Apple authorized repair shops have access to Apple's training, official repair literature, and opportunity to buy genuine parts directly from Apple. The problem is, third-party shops have to pay a fee to become authorized, and are only allowed to make basic repairs. In fact, one shop owner said, If I became Apple certified, I would lose 75% of my opportunities to do repairs on things and would have to send that business to Apple for a small finder's fee. And because Apple has a monopoly on the majority of repairs, their costs tend to be higher than necessary. So several countries and US states are trying to pass right to repair laws, which would make it easier for people to repair their own devices by forcing manufacturers like Apple to reveal repair information to the public. It would also require them to sell spare parts directly to users and third-party repair shops. That way, we'd have more options when it comes to making repairs, rather than being forced to go to Apple and pay whatever price they're asking. Now, this sounds like a reasonable law to prevent companies from monopolizing repairs of their products, but companies like Apple have been lobbying against this kind of legislation for years. Their main argument is that being the sole provider of most repairs protects their intellectual property, protects consumer safety, and protects device security. And while there may be some truth to that, I think companies like Apple can implement systems that give their users more control and more choice when it comes to who repairs their products. And the fact that most tech companies oppose this concept only adds to the suspicion that they're making a significant amount of profit from overpriced repairs. So while the cost of parts and labor are a major reason for high repair prices, there are other contributing factors, like the fact that almost every major tech company has a virtual monopoly on most repairs made to their devices. And this appears to be an important source of revenue as they're investing heavily in lobbying against laws that would make it easier for users to repair their own products. I just wish Apple, considering their prominence and size, would stand up for users' control over the products they own, as this could help push the entire industry toward the democratization of product repairs. 
Now, I want to speak to my viewers who are interested in pursuing a career in computer engineering. And the best way to achieve that goal is to develop a strong foundation of skills in math, science, and problem solving. But you don't have to wait until college to start learning. There's actually a website called Brilliant that helps you learn how to solve problems in math and science by actively working on sequences of challenges instead of passively watching lectures. They guide you through the process of figuring out each sequence, and you can actually look up hints and discuss the solution with other users. And this active approach to learning is what will really help you understand key fundamental concepts necessary to pursuing a career in technology. So to start learning with Brilliant today, go to brilliant.org slash Apple Explained and sign up for free. And if you're one of the first 200 people to click that link in the description, you'll receive 20% off the annual premium subscription. Alright guys, so that's why Apple repairs are so expensive, and if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.